A sports betting company, DraftKings, will become a public company in 2020 through a three-way business combination. It's going to be combining with a special purpose acquisition company called Diamond Eagle. Diamond Eagle is already traded on the NASDAQ. It's also combining with SB Tech, that's a provider of sports betting technology. Now, when all is said and done, the newly combined company is going to be renamed DraftKings, which is the name you all know. Joining us right now first on CNBC is DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins. And Jason, it's great to see you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Everybody. Happy holidays. Um, some big news, and you kind of wrapped all this together. I think I get it. SPAC, uh, using the SPAC to go public makes a lot of sense. But why don't you explain what the rationale is, why this makes sense for DraftKings right now? Well, this is a complicated deal. It's a three-way merger. Um, we looked at different options for financing it, and this one made a lot of sense because it allowed us to both secure capital up front through a pipe that would then be, uh, be used to complete the acquisition of SB Tech. Yes. Well, they we raised an additional pipe as well, which so three hundred yeah, plus million dollars by Cap Research, one. Franklin Templeton, Wellington, several other great ones, and uh, then we also you know wanted to get public sometime in 2020, ideally, and. Uh, this allowed us to do both of them in the same uh, transaction as opposed to two separate transactions. So it was a good fit for us. And then SB Tech getting wrapped in, they do the back end technology that you'll be using instead of the company that you use right now? Yeah, SB Tech is a world renowned technology and trading and risk management provider for sports betting and other sorts of online gaming services. They've been around for about 12 years, I think, and really a fantastic company. We're looking forward to it. Had you not with. done it this way, would have it been a two step process? Yeah. Meaning go public and then either merge with them or buy them? Or the other way around, they, raise private you. capital to buy them and then go public together. So it would, have, it would have probably been one of those two options. We considered those two along with this, and this allowed us to do both at the same time. I think this is a great example of, of using a SPAC. In a, He's in the SPAC way. business, by the way, we should say. Yeah, but no, this is right. it's what we talked about a half hour ago. I mean, there's a, there's a real reason for you to do it this way, and congratulations. Thank I, you. I, I'm, I'm furiously kind of going through the investor presentation here and commercial breaks. I have a couple questions. One. Uh, do I have it right that revenue next year will be around about $500 million and change, and the enterprise value here is something like $3 billion? That's right. So we'll be about $540 uh, in revenue as a combined business next year, and we expect uh, about $3.3 billion uh, to be the market capitalization upon close. Okay. And how, how did investors get uh, comfortable with that valuation level? What comps do you point them to? Uh, that was uh, that's above my pay grade. We had a lot of bankers that worked on the deal. It did a great job helping. It's a unique company, so it was difficult to comp, I think, and uh, a lot of work went into it for sure. And one thing I've never seen in a SPAC, and I've looked at a lot of them, is the dual class share structure. This is the first time I've I've ever come across that. How did that come to be? Well, we felt that this was an industry that was going to take lots of twists and turns, and it was really important that the management be able to think long term and. One of the things that we you know, thought about as becoming a public company is you don't want to fall into the traps of getting too caught up in quarterly earnings and things like that. And obviously, that's an important thing, and we need to you know, hit the numbers that we promise. But we also want to have the flexibility to be able to think long term and really plan on what will drive value over the next three to five so years the, and beyond. The original SPAC was a single class. Right. Correct. So, you've had to, so as part of this transaction, you're effectively changing the classes of shares. Well, the whole thing is changing because it's right. you know three-way merger, so everything kind of hit reset. And um, and and as you, talk, I mean, one of the things that is interesting about a SPAC is you can actually speak to investors, as you said, for as long uh, as you need to. And you can share projections, right. which is distinct from an IPO. And in fact, they have shared projections. And so the question I was going to ask is, how comfortable or not, or, and how many questions did you get about the governance issue when it comes to talking to some of the big investors on this? Well, you're absolutely right that one of the benefits is to be able to socialize not only, you know, the deal and the valuation, but other aspects of it. So uh, we were pretty thorough. We talked to a lot of investors and um, generally speaking, you know, we got a lot of really good feedback on everything. And uh, I think that for the most part, we kind of stuck where we were, but we did make some changes along the way, which is, you know, a helpful part of the SPAC process to be able to get that feedback. Jason, can I just ask, in terms of raising money, going public, um, with the new fund that you've set up, why do you need to raise money right now? You guys are growing really fast in terms of revenue. What's the plan? What are you going to do with it? Well, there's a lot of new states that have recently legalized online sports betting. Michigan just recently, Colorado uh, about a month or so before. Um, so we have a lot of really exciting you know, new markets that we would like to launch. And that requires capital investment. So, uh, so this is about building out and building the business, not about cashing out early investors. No, no. This is going to be mostly primary capital.
Jason, we know the opportunity in the U.S. with all the major sports. Overseas, particularly in Europe, soccer is huge. What's the opportunity outside of the U.S. in a sport like that? Well, I definitely, I mean, sports betting has been around in Europe, Australia, and other parts of the world for a while, and there's regulation happening all over the globe right now. So we think longer term, this is a really exciting international opportunity. Our primary focus is going to be the United States, given, you know, really what we see is a market that's going to be rapidly developing. I think you guys, CNBC, had an article that 2020 will be the year of sports betting uh, yesterday or the day before. So, so. If football is the number one sport on betting. What's number two and three? You know, it depends, uh, it depends on the time of year, um, you know, with so many uh, new states and growth, it's kind of hard to tell. But the big ones are football, basketball, baseball, college sports are quite large as well. Uh, and then golf, hockey and some others are, are growing quite nicely. Uh, Jason, want to thank you for being with us today. It's really a pleasure having you here. And we hope on day one. Yeah, you'll come back and tell us more as this progresses.